Time to get serious. Oh, are we on? Oh, okay. <laughs> get serious. This is serious business. All right, you guys. Did you all enjoy your soup? Huh? It was good, huh? Good. I'm going to have some of that when I get home tonight. Uh huh. Thank you. Oh, I better stay here. He said move over to the left. So move to the left, move to the right. Who knows? So, anyway, so good to be here with you guys every Wednesday night going through this book together. And so we're going to. We're going to find the end of 2 Samuel tonight, um, but we are studying the life of David, and it doesn't end in 2 Samuel. So we are going to more than likely seamlessly go right into 1 Kings to continue the story of David, and so that will probably launch us through another book, but... Uh, Interesting that the story doesn't end with Samuel, for, or Second Samuel. You'd think it, he would be done, and you know, you go into First Kings, and it'd be, but it didn't. It, they didn't do it like that. So uh, we're gonna probably venture into First Kings, also. So oh, there we go. Anyway, let's pray, and we'll get going. Father, we want to come to the to the throne. We want to come in your presence, Lord. We want to give you thanks and praise, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. We want to thank you for your word. Lord, I was so blessed tonight as I heard people praying, and they were actually praying your word. They were speaking your word as they were praying, Lord. How encouraging uh, that we can do that. We thank you for that, that we can make your word our own, and that we can speak it and we can make our praises known and our requests known to you and remind ourselves of just how great of a God we serve. Lord, as we continue our study, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would um, encourage us, Lord, and um, continue to strengthen our lives through the little things that we're learning as we go through these books together. Holy Spirit, we always, as tonight, we always look to you to be our teacher, to be the one that makes this stuff touch our spirits, Lord. That's what we need. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So let's pick this up in verse 1. And uh, we'll get it going. Chapter 24, 2 Samuel, verse 1. Again, now right away I read that earlier and I thought, here we go again, right? After all that we've seen, again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, go and number Israel and Judah. And so the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. And count the people, that I may know the number of the people. Then Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are. And may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of the army, they went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. So, you know, what's the big deal about counting the people? What's the issue with that? Well, it is a census. It is, and, and it was done for, in many, many cultures, it was done for taxes to see what kind of revenue they could get. Um, this is being done. Beg your part. Exactly. This this is a prideful act from David. This is David wanting to know how mighty his army is, and this is not David's army. As a matter of fact, these aren't even David's people. These are God's people, right? He said that to them. He told them that. He told them, do not number the people. 
I'll take care of the number. You know, it reminds me so much of church. Because I hear this all the time from people. Wow, numbers were kind of low today. Or, wow, there were a lot of no- people there today. And, and, and I fall into that trap. So when there's less people, you go home with your tail between your legs. When there's more people, you feel like a peacock walking around, right? It's a prideful thing. How many people, you know, can show up on a Sunday morning? Um, I've been in churches where they have these plaques. They, they put them on the wall. <laughs> the attendance last Sunday was, and they put it up there. And it's kind of like, I wouldn't like that as a pastor. I think I would get even more discouraged having to stare at that every week, you know. Um, but no, really, what is the deal with numbers? It is a prideful thing. And, and again, you know, it says the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and that the Lord moved David to number them. So you would think, now why would God do that? Why would God push David into something like this when the consequences of David's choice we're going to see are dev- it's devastating? A lot of people's lives get totally ruined because of this one act that David chose to do. He wanted to know how many strong military men he had and being the mighty king he was. And uh, so when you get into like, uh, oh man, I think the story is in First Chronicles, the same event is recorded. But it says that Satan did this in First Chronicles. It doesn't say the Lord did it, it says Satan did it. So people, oh, there's the contradiction. So it must not be the word of God because one book says it was Satan. The other one says it was God. Which one was it? Well, I think they were both at play here. They were both at play. It was Satan that was allowed by the Lord to tempt David to do this. David had an anger against Israel and also the Lord. It says his anger was aroused. Why was his anger aroused? Was it because of something they had done last week? Or was it something that was about to happen? Well, I think it was aroused because of something that was about to happen. God knew, the Lord knew what was about to happen. He allows Satan, just like in the book of Job, He allows Satan to do his little things, and perhaps Satan thinks, yeah, I'm in charge, I'm going to take this guy down. He'd been trying to take Jesus down since the book of Genesis, right? And all these opportunities that he gets to do it, he always fails. He never wins. He's never going to win. But the Lord allows those things to happen. But here's the craziness about sovereignty I don't really understand all of that, but everything the enemy does plays right into the hands of God. God never loses. He's never never fooled. He, He never comes up short. He's totally on top of it all. And he's using this fallen angel, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him. He goes by many names. Um... But he's allowing him to go about his business. And as he's going about his so-called business, he's actually accomplishing God's will. God's using it to perpetuate his plan. I love that. That should be encouraging to us tonight. You feel like you're under attack sometimes? Anybody ever feel like they're under attack from the enemy? Oh my goodness, absolutely. But at the same time, we got to say, you know what, Lord? I'm trusting in you. You're bigger than the enemy. You've already defeated the enemy. And so what is my role here? Well, my role is when I'm under attack, literally to talk to myself. I don't know about you. I have to talk to myself quite often to remind myself. Myself says to myself, you know God's in control, don't you? 
You know God paid an ultimate price so that you could be his child. You remember that? Yes, I do. Yes, I do, self. Then why are you fretting, self? Well, I don't know, self, why I'm fretting. You know, you have this kind of a a conversation going on, but we have to remind ourselves, and I think the Holy Spirit does this a lot for us. He reminds us through our own thinking about the things of God. God is in control. He is sovereign. There's nothing that slips through the cracks when it comes to God and his plan for humanity. Um, And so it will be accomplished. But here we have a, a man who is prideful. He's getting ready to do something that he was told not to do. And you can tell by the reaction from Joab and the, uh, uh, all the other commanders. It wasn't just Joab. It was a lot of other people, too, that were saying, David, don't do this. You don't need to do this. I mean, Joab even tried to approach this from the, the positive rebuke, if you will. You know, may the Lord make a hundred times more people in your army and may you live to see it. In other words, you don't need to do this. You don't need to number them. God's going to prosper them. God's going to build your army, you know. Um, But David, no, he says, I want you to go from, I want you to cover the whole land and I want to know the number of the people. I want to know how strong I am. And, of course, Joab tries to talk him out of it. But David's kind of a, a stubborn fellow. He's, you know, I, I think he's a bonehead sometimes with some of the thinking that goes on here. There's another lesson here for us, too. Pay attention to what people are telling you when they're trying to give you godly advice. Right? Because sometimes, you know, we get in these things where somebody's hurt us and we're just bound and determined that we're going to get even or we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And someone is saying, you know, Jesus said you need to pray for them. Pray for them. I want to beat them down. I don't want to pray for them. I'll beat them down, then I'll pray for them. No, no, that's not the heart that Jesus is talking about, you know. So I can listen to that counsel and I can say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. I think we have to be humble sometimes and we have to listen to people around us because God will speak to us through people who are around us who are godly people. And so Joab tries real hard, but we see here, nevertheless, there's that word, nevertheless, he decided we're going to go count these people anyway. And so they crossed over the Jordan in verse 5 and they camped in Aro year. However you say that, that's a hard one. Um, on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad. The ravine, it's a valley, uh, towards Jazer. And they came to Gilead, and to the land of uh, Totem, Hodshi. They came to Dan, Yahan, and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites, And the Canaanites. And then they went out south. To south Judah as far as Beersheba. And so when they had gone through all the land. They came to Jerusalem at the end. This is how long it took them to do this. Nine months and twenty days. This wasn't a weekend jaunt. Nine months and twenty days. That's a lot of counting. Right? And the whole time these nine months and twenty days is going on. The Lord's anger is getting kindled more and more and more against them. So verse 9, Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king. It says in Israel there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And in Judah there were 500,000 men. So you got, what is that, 1.2 million soldiers altogether. Now, you get into, again, these stories are repeated in Chronicles. There's different numbers there. Um, I think it's 1.1 million in Israel and a totally different number in, in Judah. Why is that? Why is it that numbers in the Bible, um, in these types of stories, seem to be a problem? There seems to be always some sort of 
controversy over how many were killed or how many there were. Or, you know, the numbers change from one book to the next. And most scholars think that that's not so much inaccuracy of the number as it is um, a scribe's error, in a copyist's error in the number. Because when you write down a number, in, especially in the Hebrew, it only takes a little dot here, a tittle there, or you could change the whole complex of the whole number just with a tiny, tiny little misreading of it from, from the ones who were making the copies. That's what they believe is the reason uh, for the difference in numbers. So does that make the Bible not God's Word? I mean, some would say that there's your evidence right there. The Bible contradicts itself. One book says this many, the other book says this many. Yes, but there is a valid explanation for this. And does it really matter anyway? How many there were? Whether it was 1.1 million or, you know, whatever, you know, they came up with here, 800,000? It doesn't really matter. The point is, what he did is what matters, right? He was willingly disobedient to God. Man, that is, I know what that's like when you're willingly, anybody else in here know what that's like? I hope I'm not alone. Willingly, not accidentally, willingly disobedient to God. I know what you say, but I really, you know, I don't, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then I have to face the consequences of that. And gosh, you know, apart from God's grace, those consequences could be death. Those consequences could be so much worse than, than what God stayed his hand. And we're going to see that here in our story, that there comes a point where God says, that's enough. Stop, right? So Joab gives the sums of the number. Now, and again, this shows us, you go out and you purposely sin against the Lord. And because the Holy Spirit is in our lives, Jesus told us, I'm going to send the Helper to you. And one of the things he's going to do is he's going to convict you of sin. He's literally going to convince you of your sin. He's going to be the voice. You know, you don't want to do that, Tom, because you know that that's not going to please God. And he's really blessed you a lot, and you really don't want to deal with those consequences. They may be tomorrow consequences. They may be 10 year down the road consequences. Who knows? But then, so many times, God's grace comes to play here, and he stays it off. He stops it before it becomes lethal. And allows us to live another day. Allows us to repent one more time. And so David here in verse 10, he's feeling pretty bad about what he did. I don't really get it because he knew when he sent these guys out nine months ago that he was making a huge mistake. David's heart was condemned after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So, Lord, I'm real sorry about what I did, but can I just kind of slip through without any consequences? Can't you just, like, forgive me? Is that just? Would you do that as a king? Oh, maybe you did do that as a king. But it wasn't justice. It wasn't right. Some of your judgments weren't godly judgments as you're ruling and reigning over the, over the, the, the land. Take away the iniquity of your servant. How do you do that? There's only one way to do that. And how is that? How can God take away our iniquities? Somebody help me. Jesus. 
takes away our iniquity. But does that mean there's no consequences for those things? No, there's still consequences. We might be forgiven, but there's still consequences. So David's praying now, he's confessing, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Take away the iniquity of your servant. I have been a fool. I've acted like a fool. So when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. And so Gad came to David and told him, and he said, Shall seven years of famine come to you and your land? Or shall you flee for three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. That's a pretty interesting thing, isn't it? That God would give David a choice in his punishment. I thought that was pretty interesting. And David says to Gad, (laughs) I'm in great distress. Duh! Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hands of man. What's he saying there? I don't want to be chased around by my enemies anymore. I don't know what that's, I'm not a young man anymore. I don't want want to fall into the hands of these heathens as they chase me around the countryside. Uh, I'm just going to trust God. And whatever happens with the plague, happens. So he chooses the plague. Three days. So the Lord sent the plague upon Israel. From the morning until the appointed time. All the way from Dan to Beersheba. 70,000 men of the people died. And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction. And he said to the angel who was destroying the people, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, Aruna, the Jebusite. So a little history here. Aruna, the Jebusite, was a king. He was actually the king of Jerusalem. The Jebusites occupied Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It wasn't called Jerusalem at the time, but when David adopted Jerusalem to be his capital, this king was pretty much pushed to the side. He was still rich. He still had land. He still had property right there around Jerusalem, but it talks about this Jebusite now, and this is a very interesting thing. And so David, in verse 17, spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people, and he said, Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and my father's house. Now he's changing his tune. It's too late. You made your choice. 70,000 people have already died. And now you see this angel coming to destroy Jerusalem where you live. And now you're singing a different tune. These poor little sheep. What have they done? Well, hey, you know what? Do you remember very much about how Israel and Judah behaved? They were idol worshipers. They rebelled against God. They put their children in fire for sacrifices. They did abomination against God, horrible things. So it's not like Israel and Judah are these little eh, innocent little sheepies. They were wicked people. They were so human. And of course, their, their sinful nature constantly was surfacing. They, they were very impressionable, like a child. They, they could be steered in many different directions by different influences. Let your hand, he said, be against me and my father's house. And so Gad came that day to David and he said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord 
on the threshing floor of Araunah, the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now you notice he didn't say go down and erect an altar. He said go up. You never say, let's go down to Jerusalem. You never say, let's go down to the house of the Lord. You always say, let's go up to the house of the Lord. I think it's in one of David's Psalms, he said, my heart was happy when they said, let's go up to the house of the Lord. Well, Jerusalem, you know, sits on top of a mountain. So you really can't go to Jerusalem without going up. But here we have this little area right here, this little tiny thing that, that David's going to do. And it tells us that when he went up to the threshing floor of Arun, Arun, Aruna, the Jebusite, he went up to the threshing floor. And verse 20, Arauna looked and saw the king and his servants coming towards him. So Arauna went out and he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Arauna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. What's a threshing floor? Do you guys know what a threshing floor is? It's a place where they would separate the wheat from the chaff. At harvest. So they would take all the wheat, you know, and they would have it like in a blanket or whatever sheet. A tribulum, thank you. A tribulum, okay. And they would shake up the wheat in the tribulum. And as the wind would blow, the chaff would blow away. So it would separate. Otherwise, they'd have to go grain by grain, you know. That would. But this was the method that they used to separate the wheat from the, tra uh, from the chaff. So it's called a threshing floor. And they were all over the place. This, was, this wasn't an uncommon, wherever they had a wheat harvest, that's how they would uh, prepare the wheat for use. And so David wants to buy this particular threshing floor from Arauna. Aaron has said to David, verse 22, Let the Lord, the king, take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All of these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aaron has said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Interesting. Obviously, this Jebusite king was not a believer in Jehovah. Let the Lord your God, not our God, not my God, but your God. And then the king said to Arauna, No, I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. And so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And so the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So we have this beautiful picture of David offering up these sacrifices. In this, at this threshing floor that he's purchased from this um, heathen king. Now, a lot of you may know this. Some of you may not know this. This particular spot right here is eventually where Solomon's temple would be built. This is the temple mount before it was ever a temple mount. This is the same place that Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice early on. So this place, this spot on Mount Moab is, uh, Horeb is a very unique, special place.
place. Why? Don't know. But you know the story of Abraham. You know how he took his son to offer his one and only son to the Lord. In that very, very spot. Some even would go as far as to say that very same mountain, that not at the Temple Mount right there, but just outside the walls of the Temple Mount, that's where the Messiah was killed. Just like Abraham's son was, was took up there to be sacrificed, our Messiah, God's son, was taken to the very same place and nailed to that cross. Now that just blows my mind. That is more than just coincidence. It's a beautiful picture. That was a holy place. And I believe today it's still a holy place. And that God still has great plans for that holy place. And I'll just throw this in here, by the way. You know, the, the Temple Mount is pretty controversial. Because they built the, 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 the Muslim... Dome of the Rock there, the, their, their worship, that's like the second most holy place in Islam. But they've discovered recently that it wasn't built on the exact site of Solomon's temple. It was built in the outer court of the temple. So the Holy of Holies isn't there. The Holy of Holies is next to the temple, next to the Dome of the Rock there. And this is why in Revelation we saw that the temple would be rebuilt. And John was told to take a measuring stick and to measure the grounds of the temple that would be built. And he said, the outer court, don't bother with the outer court. That's been given over to the Gentiles. That's where the Dome of the Rock sits today. So what we're looking at happening here, and of course you and I will be with Jesus when this all transpires, um, there will be a, a deal where they will allow the temple to be rebuilt, but it will be rebuilt next door to the Dome of the Rock. God has a way of working things out, you know. For years and years, people said, oh, there's no way the temple can ever be rebuilt. It would cause a world war to try to tear down the Dome of the Rock. They don't have to do that. They don't need to do that. The real estate that's, that's next to it, that big, giant, empty slab, is just waiting for that treaty to be made. And so David builds this altar. He offers these sacrifices. Now turn over to 1 Kings. We have 15 minutes. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, Now King David was old. And he was advanced in years. And they put covers on him. But he could not keep warm. Now, this is really discouraging to me because he's only 70 years old. Right? Some of us in here are like going, what? 70? Well, you know, people didn't have such a long lifespan back then anyway. But think about all the battles and all the things that David had been through in his life. You know, his body was beaten and bruised and scarred and broken. And at 70 years, he probably had the body of a 120-year-old person, you know. And obviously, he has heart problems because his circulation isn't very good. He can't get warm. And so they do the obvious here. They sent out looking for a young woman. She had to be a virgin. And she was sought out for the Lord, the king. Let her stand before the king, or serve the king. And let her care for him. And let her lie in your bosom, that our Lord, the king, may be warm. So they went out and found this really little haughty virgin. And brought her into the king and said, now you can take care of him, you can nurse him, and you can cuddle with him, and that'll help keep him warm. 
Interesting, huh? Not a bad way to end your life, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if our wives would appreciate that very much. I know they wouldn't, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> I wouldn't need something like that. I'd be dead already if I even thought about that. <laughs> so, they couldn't have just any little gal. Verse 3, they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. And the young woman was very lovely, and she cared for the king, and she served him. But the king did not know her. All right. The king did not have sexual relations with her. That's what that says. It's not that he didn't know her. Of course he knew her. But that's the phrase that's used in the Bible to talk about you know what. Right? How would you word that? Um, I don't know. We'll move on. So the woman was very lovely and she's taking care of the king but they did not Commit adultery, put it that way. And then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself. Haggith was one of David's wives. And he said, this is David's son, he said, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. So you remember Absalom was kind of Dave's favorite. He really liked Absalom. Absalom was good looking. He was tall. Uh, we know how his life ended. Uh, he got hung in the tree um, and, died and was killed by uh, uh, David's commander. So this gal uh, gave birth to um, Adonijah, and David didn't say a word to him about, why are you preparing yourself for the throne when I haven't told you that the throne's going to be yours? Isn't that kind of, I'm the king, isn't that kind of my call, right? Why are you taking it upon yourself? And so then he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abathar the priest. And they followed, and they helped Adonijah. Seemed like the right thing to do. I mean, Adonijah's a good-looking fella. Um, you know, he's in line for the throne. And uh, evidently, since David was silent on the issue, Joab decided, okay, maybe this is the dude, and we'll help him out. But Zadok, the priest... And Beniah, the son of Je Jehoiada, bleh. Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Re, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, Zoheleth which is by in Regel. He also invited all of his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah and the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaniah, the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? And David, our Lord, does not know it? Come, please, let me now give you advice, that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon will reign after me, and he will sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? And then while you are still talking there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. So there's this coup going on here behind David's back he they're probably thinking you know ah, he's just an old man he's senile he doesn't know what's going on you know we're going to pull this off without a problem but he did promise Bathsheba 
early on that her son, Solomon, would one day sit on the throne. And this is what she's calling him on it. So Bathsheba went to the chamber of the king. And the king was very old, and Abishag the Shumanite was serving the king. And Bathsheba bowed, and she did homage to the king. And the king said, What is your wish? And then she said to him, My lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now, look, Adonijah has become the king. And now, my lord the king, you do not know about it. You don't even... That kind of reminds me of uh, some of the leaders we got running the show today, right? Half of them are walking or sleepwalking. They don't even know what's going on around them. We won't mention names. He has sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance. And he has invited all the sons of the king, Abathar the priest, Joab the commander of the army, the Solomon your servant he had not invited. And as for you, my lord, O king... The eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will happen when my lord the king rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And just then, while he was, she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in also. And so they told the king, saying, Here's Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he's gone down today and sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance. He's invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, Abathar the priest. And look, they're all eating and drinking before him. And they say, Long live King Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your servant, or Zadok the priest, or Benaiah, the son of Je Jehoiada, or your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done by my lord the king? And have you not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So now they're both in there making their case. You don't have a clue what's going on, Dave. These guys are partying it up, yucking it up, sacrificing animals, drinking, just having a great time because they're uh, going to anoint and crown Abathar or uh, Adonijah. So King David answered and he said, Call Bathsheba to me. And so she came to the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath. And he said, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So I certainly will do this this day. And then Bathsheba bowed her face to the earth and paid homage to the king and said, let my Lord King David live forever. And King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king. The king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule, and take him down to Gihon. And there let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. And then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he will be king in my place for I have appointed him to be king ruler over Israel and Judah. And so Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. May the Lord God of my Lord the king Say so, too. As the Lord has been with my Lord the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord David. So Zadok the priest, Nathan, Benaniah, Joiada, uh, Cherethites. <clears throat> wow, long chapter, huh? 
and the Pelethites. They went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule. And they took him to Gihon. When Zadok the priest, he took a horn of oil from the tabernacle. And he anointed Solomon. And they blew the horn and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him. And they played flutes and they rejoiced with great joy. So that the earth seemed to split with their sound. Wow, quite the party. Now Adonijah, meanwhile, and all of the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing eating. And when Joab heard the sound of the horn, he said, Why is the city in such a noisy uproar? And while he was still speaking, here came Jonathan, the son of Abathar, the priest. And Adonijah said to him, Come in, you're a prominent man, and bring good news. And Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, No, our lord the king David has made Solomon the king. So the king has set with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they've made him ride on the king's mule. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon. And they've gone up from there rejoicing, so the city's in an uproar. That's the noise that you're hearing. And Solomon is sitting on the throne of the kingdom. And moreover, the king's servants have gone to bless our Lord King David, saying, May God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. And also the king said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has given one to sit on my throne this day, while my eyes see it. So all the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid, and they arose, and each one went his way. And now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. So he arose, and he went and took hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of the king Solomon. For look, he's taken a hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with a sword. And then Solomon said, If he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of him shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent them to bring him down from the altar, and he came and fell before King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, Go to your house. Solomon could have killed him Right there. He's grabbing a hold of the horns of mercy, begging for mercy. And Solomon gives him mercy. So the coup that they tried to pull off is foiled. And Solomon now reigns as king in Israel. So pretty interesting stuff going on there, huh? Palace intrigue, I guess. Huh? You know, it's, it's interesting because we hear so much about, like, England and the king and the prince and the, all the stuff that goes on there and the palace. And, you know, these people are really strange people. And I don't even know what they do. I don't know what, what they, I don't even know what purpose they serve, but they make the people feel good. Um, but palace intrigue. All this stuff going on. And, you know, it's kind of sad that here again, David's lack of being a good father kind of brought this upon himself. He wasn't paying attention. He wasn't watching out for what was going on. And he should have known his son well enough to know that the first chance he gets, he's going to turn on me. But he was totally unaware, totally ignorant of it. Now, if it wasn't for God's grace... If it wasn't for God's provision and plan for Israel, that guy would have, his other son would have become king. Who knows what would have happened to Israel. So, anyway, interesting things. And uh, we'll pick it up next week when we come together. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Gosh, Lord. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. And, uh, uh the different motives and the different types of hearts. And, and uh, Lord, we can look at these stories and we can think, wow, that's still going on today. Human beings are still the same. But Lord, 
the good news is you're still the same also. You're the God of mercy, God of grace. You do not change. You're always the same. You always will be. You have been great from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. We acknowledge that tonight. We acknowledge our love to you. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.